the discussion, uh, as I said, is really uh, very, very interesting and very helpful. Um, uh, however, now I don't have much time left, so um, <laughs> I would like to declare that uh, from now on, give me 40 minutes, let me finish my part, see if I can finish, and then we will see how much time we have left, and then we can engage the discussion like before. Okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, Looking at this transition matrix uh, briefly, uh, so this is uh, the Corning quantile, uh, parent quantiles of 20 uh, percentile, 40 percentile, 60 percentile, 80 percentile, 100. So the five five ranks. Okay. So we can see if you are four in the lowest bottom, the main bottom is 39 percent. Okay. If you are on the top, you remain on the top, the children remain on the top percentile, uh, quintile is 52%. Okay. And what is the uh, percentile, uh, percentage of bottom emerge, okay, bottom parents emerge as top on the children's distribution is only 3%. Okay. And uh, if you are on the top, but you decline to become, your children are not doing so well and become the bottom one, then it's 3%. Okay, so that is early cohort. Okay. For late cohort, it's uh, one one, bottom bottom is 45%. Okay, increase. Uh, top, 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 okay, top parents, top children, 45%. Uh, bottom parents, top children, 3%, okay, a little bit higher than this. Top parents, become, children are doing badly, 1.2%. So we have, you know, so this compared to this is a you know, decline, okay, and uh, this is going up. So, I mean, this, this transition matrix uh, just tell us roughly how different people, different groups of people transit from one status to another status. Okay, so that, that can tell us some information, uh, but uh, we have to look at the regression to see the uh, things. Right now these things are a little bit mixed as we see here. Okay, so this is a little bit small. Uh, can you guys see? In the back, you can yeah, see. Even I can, so. <laughs> even you can. Yeah, no problem. Your side is what, 1.5? <laughs> no, with the glass. With glass is 1.5? No. no. No? Okay. <laughs> I, I often meet a senior guy, he's uh, around 60, and he's very proud. So even at 60, my side is 1.5. <laughs> <laughs> oh. If you, if you uh, control L, you'll get that full screen, it'll be a little bigger. Okay. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, the full screen. That's not full screen. I think that is the full screen. No, no. You can pull down from view. View. Control L. Control L. Control L. L. Oh, good. Thank you. Okay. So that's slightly better. Now 1.3 can see. Yes. Okay, you're ready with your glasses off. Okay. So, okay. So all children, looking at the earlier cohort, and then this is the late cohort, earlier cohort, the uh, by gender, okay? So this is the estimate, okay, point three. Uh, so later cohort is point four, so it goes up. So it goes up means intergenerational mobility going down. Sun, point three, uh, later cohort point four again coefficient goes up means uh, intergenerational mobility going down. Daughter point two point four so this increased a lot as I uh, announced earlier. So the change is all positive, which means the coefficient have all gone up, uh, implying intergenerational mobility has all gone down okay, from early cohort to later cohort. 
Analytic mean, okay? So income correlation. So uh, this is now uh, the you know adjusting for standard error. That's just uh, the log log coefficient. Okay. Uh, similar picture. Early cohort, later cohort, the difference is is positive because they have all gone up, and the difference again is very big for daughters for females. Okay. Rank rank regression. Okay. Again. Early cohort, later cohort, they all gone up 0.2, 0.3, okay, 0.3 to 0.325, and daughters 0.17 to 0.39. Again, the daughter coefficient is really going up a lot. So again, all consistent uh, picture, regardless which regression we use, using with log log regression, which has the level information in income, or right, or adjusting for standard deviation, still same picture. And if you look at rank rank, it's all the same picture. Okay, so sensitivity analysis. So additional controls for communist party membership of, of the father, average schooling years of the parents, and so on. Uh, again, it's a very consistent uh, picture. Okay, so this is what we call augmented income regression. Okay. Early cohort, late cohort coefficient have all gone up. Early cohort, late cohort correlation, rank, rank. Okay. Early cohort, late cohort coefficient have all, have all gone up. So uh, by region, so we want to see how the same uh, differ across region, whether the economic reform, as I said earlier, affected the different region differently. Uh, we see early cohort, East, okay, <coughs> later or east, east coefficient going up, okay, intergenerational mobility going down, okay, this is a regression coefficient. Central also going up, west going up a lot, right, okay, 0.222.545, okay, so the west is really, you know, suffering relatively, okay. Income correlation, again, east, central, west, western, uh, uh, the coefficient increase the largest means intergenerational mobility decline the largest as well. Rank rank coefficient again east central they are all going up again west is a region which intergenerational mobility declines the most. Okay, so now there is another concept in, in the literature. Uh, um, it's called absolute versus relative intergenerational income mobility. What we have been doing so far is called relative income mobility in the literature. Okay, so rank rank estimate measure the relative income mobility. Uh, so parental rank and the children's rank. So if we divide it by region, for example, east, central, and west. So beta one. R here estimate relative income mobility across generation within region I. So for example, if beta one goes up means intergenerational association goes up, implying relative mobility across generation declines. Okay. Now beta zero R here denotes the ex expected rank of children from the lowest income family. So if you set this to zero then this is the constant. So this in the literature is called a relative income mobility, although I think this uh, notion may not be well defined. But anyway, that's what they call the relative income mobility. Now what is, the, so the problem with relative income, uh, relative mobility is this. You don't know who is moving to where. It could be the top guys going all going down to become the poorest, and it will tell you the mobility is very high, but that's no good, right? So, worst outcome children from rich income families, that will give you a high mobility. That's not what we want. Or it could be better children from the lower income family. So it could be either way. Could it be top, the children from rich family going down, or children from poor family going up. They will both give us high mobility. Right, but so that's the problem with this uh, mobility coefficient. Uh, so to deal with that, uh, in the literature, 
uh, Chucky, and then in their paper, they say, we define this absolute upward mobility. Okay, how do we define that? We define that by looking at 25th percentile. Okay, suppose we look at 25th percentile of, of the parents. So they are the bottom people. And then we look at how the children of those parents do. So it, it, now why this would be a, a, a good measure? Because we know the rank rank is very much linear. And 25th percentile is the average for the bottom half of, so the bottom half of the population and then the mean of the bottom half is 25th percentile, right? So if you 50-50, you look at the median, the, the lowest half, the median is 25. So we are looking at the average person in the poor group, how do they perform? Right, so that, that gives us, you know, if it's 36, then we know it's moving up from 25 to 36. If it's, you know, 50, we know it's from 25 moving to 50, and so on and so forth. Okay, so this explains this uh, thing. Okay, and for this measure, both the intercept or constant term and the slope both were met, whereas for the relative mobility measure, we only look at the coefficient beta, as you recall, right? We only look at the beta. But here, they, they were both matter. Right? So, uh, absolute upward mobility, relative mobility, so, uh, and the west, central, and east. Okay, so we see uh, in the earlier cohort, uh, the absolute mobility, upward mobility, is west is doing the best. Okay. So this coefficient, the relative mobility, the higher the coefficient means the lower the mobility. You remember? So the, it's an association between the two parents and children. So the higher is the coefficient, the lower the mobility. But for the absolute measure, the higher the this number, the highest mobility, because we are fixing the right hand side at 25 percentile. So west is, is, the, is the best. So in old days, west in terms of absolute upward mobility is doing the best. In terms of relative mobility is also the best because the coefficient is the lowest. <coughs> Late cohort, central, east, west, right? So again, uh, late cohort, now the order has changed, right? Now, the West is, 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 is doing the worst. And now the West is also doing the West. So uh, <coughs> for the late, later one, the difference is uh, between East and Central. East and Central, the, these two are not statistically significant. Okay. Uh, now, it's not... Uh, Difficulty to explain why West it was doing so well in the past, but not doing so well now. But as you know, uh, in China, um, you know, after the Communist Party took over the country in 1949, uh, the West was uh, very backward. So the government gave a lot of priority, favorable policy in terms of treatment for the Western region, so industrialized and so on and so forth. The Western region in old days, because of uh, such favorable policies, they, they were doing well in terms of uh, relative and absolute. But the reform in recent few decades has benefited the East much more than the West, as we have seen earlier. Right? So nowadays, the West is not doing so well in terms of absolute or relative mobility. Someone there raise a hand or something? No, no question? Okay. Okay, so, so this uh, picture here, uh, <coughs> absolute mobility. Uh, so it's, this is something called a heat map. It just records those coefficients we found early and uh, reported it. It's, 
Jackie and those people call this heat map. So you can uh, refer to their paper. Uh, so we put the estimate in this coefficient, and we basically the same uh, same we saw before. Uh, later cohort, okay. Again, uh, so it's those uh, things we saw. Uh, now here, someone asked about the core resident bias. Uh, was it you? Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, potential biases with estimates of intergenerational income mobility. There's core residents, okay. So children who might migrate permanently are not. Included permanent, okay, temporary is still included, but permanent are not really included. Okay. And life cycle bias in the later cohort, the later cohort, right, born in after 70, 1970, so they are very young. So average age was only 25. Therefore, for the children, when we try to measure their income, it, it's at their early stage. So the, it, it's life cycle bias. So, uh, uh, so to overcome uh, uh, this uh, data limitations, we uh, turn to a new data set. Because the other data sets are also quite old, right? The chip data, as you have seen. So this one is Chinese Family Panel Studies, 1920, okay? to, in to investigate intergenerational ed education mobility. I think this is the survey which uh, she one of the PIs. Uh, okay. So this uh, data, as we will see, have a lot of uh, good things. So to our best knowledge, the only household survey in China collecting information on all the direct relatives and <coughs> siblings not living at home. Okay, so that, that is a good thing about this data set. And overcome co-resident bias, okay, whether you live together or not living together. Education is less subject to life cycle bias, right? So if you are 25 or 30, your education is more or less done. It's not like income. If you are 25 or 30, your income is still very low, right? So education is, is subject to less subject to life cycle bias. And management error in schooling is much less, much less than income. Income is a very noisy thing, especially if you are rich, you may tend to under-report. If you are not so rich, you may tend to over-report, right? Uh, okay, and sub sample size is also very big, 25 provinces, okay? And uh, so fi about 15,000 households. Okay, so there, that's some main uh, summary statistics. Okay, so similar regression as uh, for the income. Now we have education of the parents, parental average schooling years, okay, and the children, the child's schooling year, okay, and so on. So we, we control for a set of dummies over here. And also we take care of standard deviation adjustment, right? Different generation may have different parents in schooling, so we also look at this thing, okay? And we also look at rank rank regression. What is parent average schooling in terms of parents' uh, education distribution, and what is the rank of the child in the current distribution, okay? So again, we look at this transition matrix, and again, the, the thing, uh, it just for some information, uh, bottom, parents in the bottom, education distribution, remain, children remain in the bottom 28%. Parents on the top percentile, and children also happen to be the top percentile, is 39% or 40%. Uh, Bottom, bottom, going up 37%. Uh, top, top, also going up 48%. So it's mixed, you know, it looks like, you know, if you're low, then you're low. If you're top, it's top. Uh, but the, 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 this figure, uh, top becomes poorest, right? Going from 5% to 2%. And the lowest, <coughs> bottom parents, top children 14%. 
at 8%. So gives us some idea. Again, we, let's look at the regression to, to make sense. So here we see uh, earlier cohorts, uh, <coughs> all those same regression coefficient. Okay, the difference is, is positive in prime intergenerational mobility is going down. Uh, sons, uh, in terms of education, uh, the change is very little, basically not much change and not uh, different. Uh, daughter, 0.3, so it's, it's going up means intergenerational mobility going down. Uh, daughter here, going up a little bit more, Okay, but okay, rank rank is also uh, daughter in terms of rank rank going down. Uh, coefficient going up a lot means intergenerational mobility going down a lot. Okay, sons uh, going down a little bit, or children. Okay, so most of these are positive. Okay, some are small gap, some are big gap. Uh, daughter seems to be once again uh, is uh, declining. Uh, more intergenerational mobility could decline more than sons. Okay, so this is by Foucault. So, mobility, uh, early cohort, later cohort, and uh, urban ruler. Okay, uh, so <coughs> urban going up, mobility going down, but it's not a lot of change. Uh, ruler. Okay, so ruler is actually going down. That means mobility is going up. Okay, a little bit. It's a very okay. Some change. Education uh, correlation. Uh, ruler is so the variance seems to be a major factor here. So if you look at adjusting for standard deviation. The ruler part, the coefficient is going up, still going up. Okay, and urban, of course, uh, similar, a little bit, very small. Rank, rank, urban, coefficient going up, mobility going down. Ruler is going up a lot, mobility going down a lot in terms of. So some uh, interesting patterns over here in terms of education. Uh, by region, uh, east, okay, uh, going down a little bit actually. So east seems to be benefiting. There is some evidence east seems to be benefiting in mobility. Central uh, also benefiting a little bit, but west is a big loser. Okay, in terms of uh, adjusting for Standard deviation, east benefiting a little bit, central uh, not benefiting a lot, and east, west seems to be a bigger loser again. Rank rank uh, east in terms of rank rank also mobility also going down, central also going down, west going down a lot. Okay, coefficient increase a lot means mobility going down a lot. Okay, so this is uh, uh, again the, 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 the so-called heat map put it by region and it can it actually it's done by province. Uh, although I re report regression by region because we try to condense uh, the thing. Yeah. So uh, again, uh, uh, we will not uh, discuss this in detail. Not have time. Okay, so. Uh, this diagram is uh, what the, the what we said the very <coughs> great title of the paper, right? Uh, great Gatsby curve in China. So this uh, tell us uh, the relationship between a correlation between the Gini coefficient and intergenerational mobility. So on the on this diagram, the intergenerational relative mobility. Okay, so. As we see, the, the higher the coefficient of the coefficient, right? That means the lower the mobility, right? So this is a, a relative income mobility against the Gini coefficient. Relative income coefficient, relative income mobility is the higher the coefficient, the lower the mobility. Okay, so moving from, from here to here, it means 
uh, the mobility is going down, less mobility. Okay, so this curve tells us uh, the correlation between uh, the <coughs> cross-sectional income inequality and uh, the the mobility is a negative correlation, right? Uh, the higher the income inequality, the lower the mobility, right? So it's a positive slope means negative correlation between inequality and the relative mobility, okay? Mobility goes in the other way. So in terms of absolute income measure, absolute income mobility, right? Again, it's a negative relationship between income inequality, right? So the higher the inequality, the lower the absolute mobility, right? In this axis now, it's absolute mobility. So the higher it on going in this direction, more mobility. So if we look at the point here, the higher inequality, then the lower the absolute mobility. Again, it's negative correlation. Negative correlation. So that's bad news for us, right? Income inequality, mobility, negative inequality. The higher the inequality, the lower the mobility. That's bad. And the lower the mobility, the higher the inequality. Depends how you interpret it, right? And there, it's just correlation. Um, uh, by education, similar picture. That was by income. By education, uh, so relative mobility. Okay, positive slope means inequality, and relative mobility is in negatively correlated. So. Uh, and in absolute mobility, again, it's negatively correlated. So the, those curves in, in, in the literature is the first time with this, uh, uh, with this curve. Because we, we have time dimension. In the other study by Chetty, they also uh, and other, they, they don't have time dimension. They just have a, a cross-sectional OECD, different countries, different regions, and they have inequality and uh, mobility in different places. So, so this is the first time with evidence on, on, on time uh, dimension versus cross-section. OK, so now uh, quickly, I'm going to turn to a conceptual uh, discussion from a human capital perspective. So using model of Becker, Thomas, and Salon. OK, um, and the main point here is the economic incentive to invest in children's human capital is mainly affected by return to human capital in the labor market. That's a, uh, you can say that's an assumption. The economic opportunity refers to the family credit constraint in uh, investing in children. If you are from a rich family, you are not credit constrained, so you can always educate ch your children to the optimum school level you want. So if you are not credit constrained, Either you are very rich, or you can borrow money uh, from banks or from somewhere else. Then you, uh, basically your parental income does not affect your children's education, right? If you are not credit constrained, if you are credit constrained, then parental income will affect children's education because you 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 may not be able to choose the optimum schooling level you want for your children. Okay, um, so I'm now going to turn to the other thing to show you a little bit about the model. Okay, actually, uh, this is the earliest slide we did last year. But during last year and this year, we did a lot of work with the rank, rank and the heat map and the uh, Gapsy curve and so on. This all new. But in this uh, new, uh, in this older one, we have the model. In this slide, I, I prepared the last few days, 80 pages. I thought maybe that's enough for three hours. But uh, I think I should discuss about the model a little bit. So the model is in the paper, but not in this the other slide. So in this old uh, slide, so we have this picture of uh, you know this uh, thing 
you know, in the western region, this is uh, quite typical. You know, in the countryside, in the western region, they are very poor. Okay? And whereas in, in the coastal city, in urban area, uh, how luxury life uh, the children are living. Okay, so let me see if I can find the model quickly. Okay, here. Uh, is it, this is not full control L? Control L. Yes. Control L. Always work, huh? Control L. <laughs> <laughs> Regardless PDF or whatever, it's always okay. good. Uh, model setup. So this is a very standard model, actually. Vectors model. Terms, but we uh, basically put in the China. Okay, so maybe I shouldn't go too fast, otherwise we may lose more. <laughs> okay, how do uh, the institutional reforms I mentioned earlier? Right, like 20 minutes ago I, I discussed the institutional reforms in China. So how do the institutional reforms and the socio-economic change affect intergenerational mobility in China? And we are going to incorporate those elements into a unified theoretical model, which is based on. So the, the institutional thing we are going to incorporate into the model are based on our own ideas. The basic framework is back problems and so on and more model. And then we try to use a model to explain all the empirical findings we have so far. So now the model. So uh, briefly, so there is an endowment equation, endowment transmission equation. So think, you know, if your parents are very smart, you know, the children cannot be too stupid. So that's genetic transmission. So that can be viewed as this E i t minus one. Through this lambda parameter, this will transmit to your children, right? So this is genetic. So it's endowment, okay? And then there is the human capital production function. Okay, human capital production function has two or three things. One is the genetic endowment will affect you if you are smart, you don't have to work too hard, or right? you can sleep now and then still learn a lot. But if, if you're not so, then you better listen more carefully. Uh, here is the education. So I, T minus one, is family investment from the parents. The G, I, T minus one is the government Government investment on, you know, per head. You think with the government expenditure, what is the per head thing? Okay, so this thing is linear, and then log this part again. It's linear. Of course, this is just very strong assumption, but it's just to illustrate how the model works. Doesn't mean to be perfect model. Okay, there is an earning generating equation. So in which uh, we, if we look back. So H is a human capital, right? So there is H, there is a return to the H, right? So this is a return to schooling, and then there is a mu T, there is a constant term here. Okay, so return to schooling, uh, to human capital RT is determined by three factors. Okay, so the, this, this is the part we, we our own modeling come in, comes in. Okay, so RT we hypothesize to be a function of three things. KT, physical capital, right? The more machine you work with, the more computer you work with, the higher your productivity. So that's a physical capital. A is a technology, right? The better technology you use, the more productive you are, right? And MT is, is the main new thing here, right? So MT is what we call the market-oriented institutional reform which not only increase the marginal productivity of human capital, but also uh, shrinks the gap between marginal productivity and wage. Okay. So uh, anyway, so M is all the reform factors we think is productivity enhancing. Uh, as I said earlier, if there's no uh, credit constraint, the model can be solved very easily. Okay, so if the credit market is perfect, all parents are sufficiently rich. Okay, in this case, uh, the decision is very simple and independent of parental income. And the law linear intergenerational income regression can be easily derived from the basic setup. And you can derive the relationship between parental income and children's income. 
And this coefficient happens to be lambda TGT. Lambda T, as you recall, is the endowment transmission parameter, okay, times GT. GT is a ratio of RT over RT minus 1. So this is a ratio of return to schooling. Okay, so if you hold this uh, last year's uh, return to schooling, then this GT will be positively related to this current return to schooling. So from this uh, solution or this expression, we immediately see the higher is return to schooling, the higher will be this coefficient. The higher is this coefficient, means the higher the association between parental income and child income or parental education, children income uh, education, which means the higher is the return to schooling, the lower will be intergenerational mobility. So it comes out very straightforward. And in steady state, uh, you set this r equals r t minus 1, lambda t equals lambda t minus 1, uh, then uh, this uh, beta will be simply equal to lambda. <coughs> okay. This thing will be equal to 1. In that case, so in steady state, the intergenerational income elasticity at a steady state will be simply the gen genetic transmission parameter in this simple model. Now, with credit constraint, the issue becomes a little bit uh, tricky. Okay, so we need to specify a parental utility function, which again, we take very simple uh, log linear uh, utility function just to illustrate parental consumption and uh, children's income. Suppose parents care about, you know, is, is uh, this specification is not a strict sense of altruistic. Right. I mean, you can call it being altruistic, but it, it's really, you know, it depends how you interpret it. it, it some people will call this altruistic, right, because that will determine children's consumption. So you care about children's consumption, so that's altruistic. But if you just care about children's success, which is income by IP, right? So you care about their success, but you don't actually really care them about their consumption or welfare per se, but uh, anyway. There is a meta of interpretation here. Funded constraint, uh, straightforward tax, after tax income you spend on your own consumption or children's human capital investment. And in this case, the expression we can derive linking uh, parents' parents' income and children's income will be a little bit uh, complicated. And in this, there is this coefficient is our main coefficient. And so uh, this coefficient has two parts, one minus gamma, we call it severity of credit constraint and depends on something. And then this RT is still the return to education. So RT even here still tells us the higher is return to schooling, the higher will be this coefficient, hold the other thing constant. The higher is this coefficient, the lower the intergenerational mobility. Okay. Again, we can walk through those things and see how the government uh, spending on, on this thing, GT, which will affect this ST, this ST will affect this gamma. So basically, the government subsidy to education can help relax the, the credit constraint. That's a basic notion. Right? So uh, if the local government are very poor, there is not enough uh, Subsidy, uh, whereas the education incre education cost increase a lot, then actually the credit constraint can become more serious uh, during the reform process. So, uh, in economy, we can think of as a, a, a weighted average of, of the credit constrained family and versus non credit constrained family. So it's one minus pi, uh, beta one plus pi beta 2, okay? So we can work out the, what proportion of household will be subject to uh, credit constraint, and we call this D, and we can work out all those comparative statics uh, with respect to income, return to education, and government spending, and so on and so forth. And this P is the price of education, okay? All this thing. So uh, in quick summary, 
Well, what we find from this simple conceptual framework is the following. Return to human capital investment, uh, you know, capital, physical capital technology institutional reform. And one minus gamma is the severity of credit constraint. We call it intensive margin. Okay, so the government spending uh, can help relax the budget constraint or make uh, less severe. And the price of human capital investment, this is the university cost or high school cost, which will make the credit constraint more severe. Okay. And uh, D is a share of household subject to credit constraint, which we call extensive margin. Okay, and uh, again, uh, it's affected by a set of variables. Okay, so uh, those are the results we will cover in the other thing. Uh, but maybe let me go to, uh, perhaps I don't need to go to here. But, uh, okay, uh, I should go to the other one. Okay, where are we? Okay, coming back. So, oh, in that model, there's one variable we have not put in because, as I said, that file I showed you a few seconds ago is, is the PPT last year. And this year, we put in an uh, inequality parameter into the model, and we derive one more uh, comparative statics, uh, those things with respect to income inequality. So basically, holding all other things constant, what if uh, income inequality uh, changes due to an exogenous shock? Uh, that we can find it will reduce the intergenerational mobility. So that's one additional analytical result, which is not there, but it's in our uh, working paper. So if you are interested in looking at the paper, I'm happy to send you one so you can see in the appendix how, how it works out. OK, so uh, now with that model in mind, uh, we, we were using <coughs> it when we come along. So in terms of the empirical evidence, we find uh, cross-sectional inequality has risen, Gini coefficient has gone up. What are the reasons for the increase in cross-sectional uh, inequality? Uh, one main reason is the increase in return to education, as we have seen, the education return, both in terms of years of schooling or in terms of college, <laughs> the return has gone up a lot. And also the timing and the degree of the reform, okay? or the differential treatment of the institutional reform and the public policy change across area, rural, urban, region, and sector. So that make it different regions, and rural, urban, east, west, you know, all those things. They, they benefit, uh, the degree of, of benefit from economic reform is very heterogeneous. It's very different, actually, as we have seen. So that can explain intuitively why the cross-sectional inequality has, has increased. The reason for the decreasing intergenerational mobility, okay, as I said, uh, our paper, majority of the books is on this, and as the simple model has illustrated, right? So the reason for uh, this decreasing intergenerational mobility in in terms of our simple conceptual framework is uh, the following reasons. One is uh, return to human capital has gone up, as we have seen, that will reduce the intergenerational mobility. Economic cost of education peak has gone up a lot, so that will reduce uh, intergenerational mobility. And government uh, expenditure on schooling is good, that would improve the intergenerational mobility. And average family income has gone up. That would also improve intergenerational mobility. Uh, and degree of inequality, holding other things constant if this thing change, would also reduce intergenerational mobility. And uh, the bad thing uh, seems to dominate the good things, right? as we have seen. We have seen the intergenerational mobility has gone down. So by that fact, uh, that fact, so we know uh, those things, one, two, and five, uh, those effects are dominating the number four and number, number three and number four effect. 
Okay, why there is negative correlation, right? The great uh, Gatsby curve, right? Why there is negative correlation, <coughs> okay? Uh, now, that, that is just a negative correlation, right? Uh, I hope in the future some of you can study again the causal effect of one or other, but that will be a more challenging task. Okay. So what we find is so what we just try to you know provide some reasons why the two are correlated, negatively correlated. Okay. Uh, one reason is some factor will affect both things, will affect not only cross-sectional inequality but also intergenerational mobility. So, so, so for example, uh, return to, to human capital investment. So rising return to schooling will not, in will not only increase the horizontal inequality, but also reduce the vertical mobility. Okay? So like a return to schooling, that is one obvious example. Now, degree of inequality goes up can also lead to intergenerational uh, mobility going down, holding other things constant. Why? Because as you can see, if inequality goes up, other things constant, right? It will lead to more families subject to credit constraint. So if you hold average income, if you hold household average income constant, but you enlarge the inequality, that means more people will be subject to the credit constraint. So that's the intuition. And that would lead to uh, intergenerational mobility going down, right? And also, a higher degree of inequality also in inflates the negative effects of increase from return to schooling, as well as uh, price of education. Yeah. Makes those things, the effect even worse. Okay, now intergenerational mobility can also impact on cross-sectional inequality. So conceptually, if since there is exogenous shock to intergenerational mobility, that can also uh, uh, impact on degree of cross-sectional inequality. Uh, Becker and Thomas many years ago showed that a low inter low intergenerational mobility leads to a high steady state of degree of cross-sectional inequality. So many years ago, in a simple model, uh, they, they showed that. So in summary, the increase in cross-sectional inequality and the decline intergenerational mobility may dynamically reinforce each other, aggravating the inequality in China in the future. Very bad news. So these two things, uh, they are label brothers, 1990, uh, what's in uh, English? <laughs> Maybe someone can translate it uh, better. Okay. So, yeah. you know, one brother is in trouble, another brother is also in trouble, and then they, they, they both struggle with each other even more. <laughs> it's, uh, is a phrase for that. In Chinese, there is a very vivid expression of that. Uh, uh, partners in crime? I don't know what that is. Partners in crime, okay, I see. Yeah, it sounds like Paul. Okay, <laughs> uh, double jeopardy. Double jeopardy, right? Yes. That uh, looks like close to mimicking what I'm trying to say, okay. Okay, so that's bad news, so they can Reinforce each other. That's really too bad. Okay. So you know what's going on is 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 uh, determined by these different interactions among those factors. And as we have seen earlier, return to schooling has gone really up. So that no need to repeat. Uh, education costs going up sharply. I already expressed. Share of government, so those things we actually show already, okay, and uh, this also more or less showed up already. So as I said, uh, intergenerational mobility going down, implying the effect of increase in return to human capital, price of human capital, income inequality. 
dominating the other two effects, as I said earlier. Uh, so this is just to further uh, validate our, our claims. So the st those statistics above show that return to schooling increased uh, dramatically. Intuition cost has also increased a lot. Okay, government expenditure on education uh, has gone up a little bit, 2.3 to 4.1. Income increase uh, from 1,000 to 7,000. Uh, so that's a good ch change. But uh, the tuition cost is really uh, going up a lot. So tuition as a ratio of government expenditure and education goes up from 5% to 25%. So this uh, income increase may not catch up with the, in the tuition increase. Okay, so increase in return to human capital and price is greater than the increase in government expenditure and family income and the impact. So that I already uh, explained. Uh, that I think I can skip. Okay, so now briefly just uh, why there are some gender pattern. Right? We have seen the intergenerational mobility for females has declined more than males. Why? Right? That's one thing we're trying to, to explain, right? Now, as we see, the return to schooling is a key determinant of, of intergenerational mobility, right? That, that simple model illustrates that. Now you see uh, the curve, the return to females, okay, for women, uh, and for men, okay, this is a paper I uh, mentioned earlier about my own paper, right, uh, General Comparative Economics in, in 2005. So that is, uh, that was the first study which uh, gave document a systematic pattern of uh, return to schooling in China and tried to explain why it happened. Anyway, so in that study, uh, we find these two curves for male and female, and the thing is, the gap between them. Not only women is above women, uh, above men. The good news for women, right? Uh, there, there's a lot of research why this is so, okay, in the West, uh, you know, uh, but not much so in, in China, about China, okay? Uh, we don't have time to get into that. But not only the female return is above males consistently, the gap seems to increase. The gap increasing means the return to schooling, the change between men and women is getting larger. And that has a negative impact on intergenerational mobility for women. Right? Because R it affects intergenerational mobility negatively. So when this is getting higher and higher, it uh, reduces the, the mobility uh, for women. So on one hand, their, their return is higher. On the other hand, the chance for them to get higher education is low. Because if you are under uh, credit constraint, if your family is under credit, cons credit constraint, the parents prefer to send the boys to, to school in the rural side, in the rural side. <coughs> okay, urban may not be uh, such a problem. And so, but once you are sent to school, and then if you find a job, the women are doing you know, good in terms of returning to school. Although their income is still below men. Is that correlation or causal effect? Or, uh, causal or correlation? Oh, causal or not is a big question. Uh, in, your, your paper. in your paper, I, I don't claim it's causal. <laughs> although, although, people do it, <laughs> although people do it as if it's causal. So it depends if you think education is endogenous or not. Right? So education is a choice, but people ignore in this literature. But I wouldn't go so far to claim this is causal. Uh, so, well, that I said already. So in the in the rural area, so the gap is the rural area. Uh, the schooling years, okay, so is still below uh, the men, men. But urban, the woman is catching up. Okay, so that just explains in the rural area, very much girls are still, you know, 
and one to, to be sacrificed if the families are under credit constraint. Uh, and also that can look at the pattern by province and we find you know, for the coast the city, the return to schooling change is more and therefore you know, there's some pattern Uh, now that, that pattern on regional thing cannot be uh, explained by return to schooling, but it can be better explained by gap in per capita income and severity of credit constraint. Right, uh, intergenerational mobility is expected high in a society with high average income. Right, so in, in coastal cities, also in the rural and western region, experience tight credit constraint on investment in, in children. And share of government expenditure is low in less developed regions. So all those reasons can explain why these regional patterns uh, we have observed earlier. Uh, again, you know, regional disparity, which uh, you know, uh, for example, profit rates are 25, 28, and 32 for students from western province and, and rural areas, respectively, exceeding the national average of 22%. Okay, so this is an issue. Education cost rise too fast relative to family income increase. Okay, so break rate. Right? Okay. Uh, so in uh, Chatty, there's two. Uh, okay, uh, there are two MB working papers in this. I don't, I don't know what is A and B, but anyway, that's it. <laughs> because this is not in a paper, so uh, it's okay. So they uh, claim there are five uh, correlates of intergenerational mobility. Uh, one is residential segregation, and the other one is income inequality. Third one is quality of primary school and social capital and family stability. Okay, most of the important ones they claim. Now, some of this can be easily incorporated into our framework. Uh, for example. Uh, the physical decentralization in our in our in our model, right? Uh, so that uh, part it is already in our model. So that part can enhance the geographic variation in the school quality. So that is consistent. I mean, the, it's, it can be easily incorporated. Some cannot. For example, uh, those uh, divorce and so on, uh, and out of wedlock births. Uh, Less than one percent of parents in both cohorts were divorced in the survey year when they were fifty-five on average. So in China, perhaps uh, you know, uh, those days not so so common. Uh, now, of course, China and the U.S. are in uh, are at different stage of development. <coughs> China is been, has been going through fundamental structural change. Uh, U.S. is a uh, uh, much more uh, relatively stable. Uh, our study perhaps is uh, more similar to, uh, in terms of setting, to this uh, Olivetti and uh, Hasselman, okay, 2013 study. So they studied the change in intergenerational mobility in the U.S. during 1850 to 1930. Okay, during that period, there were also uh, drastic structural change and a fast economic growth. So perhaps, uh, you know, for those of you who are interested in this intergenerational mobility study, definitely refer to this paper, take a look. That is a historical period which is more comparable to what we are going through now. Not compared to US now, because that's not a very meaningful comparison. Right? Uh, so they find in the early 20th century, intergenerational mobility also going up. And they also attribute to an increase in return to human capital and regional disparity. So very similar during that period of study, episode, historical period, and what we are going through. So it's not the, so what China is going through is, is not very strange, okay? It, it's, it's not good news, but it, it seems to be understandable and reasonable. So don't be too upset. Um, okay, cross-sectional inequality increased both in, in China, though more drastic, 
Okay. Looking at today China and today US, the cross-sectional uh, inequality both have increased, but more so in China. However, intergenerational here is a difference between China and the US. Intergenerational mobility has increased or remained constant in the US. So in recent study by, by those authors, they find intergenerational mobility in contemporary US is improving or constant. Whereas in contemporary China, we find it's the intergenerational mobility getting worse. Okay. Now we think there are some uh, reasons to, 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 to explain why uh, it's so, right? Because in US, uh, there has been very generous increase in federal and state government expenditure on education. And uh, many programs, like means tested program, Medicaid, food stamp, and health stuff, and so on. Uh, so uh, it seems to be, in terms of our models, those things, government transfer things, it is really helping the US uh, uh, to, to uh, improve the intergenerational mobility in education and consequently in, uh, in income. China, okay, so as I said, the, the increase in the cost of education is faster <coughs> than the increase in household income for the poor family. Therefore, China deteriorate uh, in terms of credit constraint, and that may reinforce the effect of uh, increase in education <coughs> because the rich people benefit more. The rich people can send the kids to MIT, Harvard, anywhere. Right? The poor kids, where do they send? They cannot go to university. So you can see in QCubit, the gap can go. Uh, so there are some policy implication and so on. And you can always think about policy implication. Tablets, OK. Uh, as I said very clearly in the beginning, we don't establish any causality. right? And we do not separate or identify any mechanism. Right? Instead, we statistically characterize basic pattern and understand dynamic evolution of cross-sectional inequality and intergenerational mobility. And future agenda, okay, what and how does the inequality in wealth, housing ownership, and value, interview transfers, and bequests, how do those things uh, involve? And some people mention social status, maybe there's other things. How does intergenerational mobility in political status, right, social status, or political status? So I do have a question, as I said. So, uh, okay, so that's a reasonable point. Okay, and what is the implication of decreasing fertility induced by the one child policy? I mentioned this point earlier for intergenerational mobility, and uh, so there, there are the issues, right? Fertility going down, each child's fertility education should go up. In principle, the quantity quality trade off, although the impact is not, uh, is not great, as I showed uh, two years ago in the review of the economic study paper, we look at the one child policy and the quantity quality trade off. But we can think about it and then further relax now, right? And then fertility may go up again, so how does it impact? impact I think I, I'm doing perfectly fine. 58, so two minutes short for one or two questions. Okay. Uh, I have concerns over the adop adoption and uh, using twin data. Uh, for the for the twin data, um, uh, some in literature find that in census data, the twin rate is much higher than the nature rate, uh, suggesting uh, that that's the evidence for some <coughs> um, fake twin, because uh, it, it, um, some some people, uh, some parents will um, uh, delay the report of the birth of their child to to give birth to more children. Um, this uh, this twin rate is much higher in the regions uh, with higher rate of uh, of of uh, over, over births. So uh, that's my concern about the, uh, the method using twin data. Uh, another. Uh, another concern is about adoption of children. Uh, that's because um, 
in, in country, in developed countries like China, uh, it is uh, it, you know it are the parents with higher socioeconomic status that are mo more likely to adopt children. So if you we use uh, adoption data, we uh, we actually uh, estimate the mobility within the uh, relatively rich parents. Um, however, um, to some extent, we are more concerned about the poor families. Um, uh, that's my two concerns about these two methods. I, I, I'm looking forward to your opinion about my concern. <laughs> <laughs> okay, both are uh, good questions. So, in terms of twin data, of course you have to use a real twin. <laughs> if there are fake twins, you have to get rid of the problem. So if the data have problems, then what can we do? Right? So, so the, data, the twin data I have are real twin data. <laughs> <laughs> How do you figure that? <laughs> how, how, do we, how do we do it? Oh, what we did is many ways. So we use a census to identify the potential twin. Same first year, same months. We enter the household. We verify, right? So if they are fake, goodbye. Right? You collect the data by yourself? Uh, of course, by my team, but not by myself. <laughs> 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 and the people in the statistical bureau, they did the survey, not me. Okay, your second question, uh, what was it? Uh, adoption. adoption, yes, yes. I think that is an issue. That is uh, in their survey paper. Uh, we have to assume the adoption is random. So if adoption is selection, then uh, you need to deal with the problem. So, uh, I mean, that can be deal with, dealt with. So you, you think about that, you reach to a few people, well, what need for adoption? <coughs> so uh, I don't know, maybe it's some kind of element to step thing, right? So you can first figure out the lambda to take care of the adoption thing, and then put the lambda you know, in your model in the second stage. I know your model models all the stuff on board, and you do more practice steps, right? Yes. Uh, but uh, we can say that you compare this to a one that you compare this. That is that you need generate more income, uh, income yeah, this state, mm -hmm. right? Between these two scenarios, always uh, price constraints and without price constraints. Mm -hmm. But it is based on the adoption that we have already achieved a steady state. That means uh, the, the, the return to human capital is, is, is steady, right? But from the data, we can see that our return to human capital is increasing. Right, so that means, firstly, that means maybe because uh, we are changing from this that state to that that state. If this is true, your analysis of the theory model is, is reasonable because we are really in that state. But another scenario is that we are not, we have, we have not achieved a steady state. We are on a path to steady state. So my question is that if we have, we haven't achieved a steady state. Uh, we are on we are, we are on the path to set state. That means uh, our return to point capital is increasing. If this is true, my question is: Is the stat uh, is the generational income that this state uh, with credit constraints still larger than that without uh, credit constraints? Our model is not the all <laughs> steady state. Where is the model? This is the right. You're in file, right? Yeah, different files. This is the one. Yeah. If the working paper you're looking at is not all steady state. It's in steady state. Okay, let's see. Where was the one? Yeah, the steady state can simplify a lot of things. But uh, certainly you're right. It's not a lot of the thing we derive. Is a model. Yeah, because in this, in this book, it's very so, so those things are not steady state. So those things, this relationship is not steady state. Yes, this relationship, but you compare this to a one steady state. Yes, that, that, that is steady state. We, we say if they are in steady state, yeah. what, would happen? <coughs> what would happen? But the, most of the paper does not look at this. Most of the paper is looking at this. All our regression is, is on this. Yes, but only a phase two bigger than phase one, we can see that the credit constraint will 
will will will will will will uh, will make our uh, inspirational mobility more uh -huh. uh, severe. Right. And this is just to illustrate. At steady state, this is definitely greater. But even if not at steady state, this should also be true. But it's not so clear. Uh, yeah. Okay. It's very true. Fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, uh, but that evidence is based on this model. So the interpretation of credit constraint and so is a matter of interpretation, right? Mm -hmm. But most of the analysis still true even without the conceptual interpretation, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so your results. Immobility is most severe for the web, for the rural and suburban. So, but why don't you take some in action to see whether it's the daughters in the rural area that strike the results? Mm -hmm. Interaction. Yeah, maybe you can take some in action. Daughters and rural, daughters and web, something like that. Or even daughters in the rural web area. Right, yeah. I think we can do that. Yeah, yeah, good. So in the in I really like the way you had the simple theory model and use it to interpret the reduced form empirical results. But one thing in, in your interpretation you discuss G and not F to use your model terminology. Right? You told us what was going on with government expenditures on education. Right. But you didn't say what was going on over time with the pro progressivity of the public investment in children. Right, we, we know this is uh, becoming more, right? More, more, more. Yeah. So this itself is good, but this guy is really the troublemaker, right? So this guy is, 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 is uh, yeah. So this part is, is good to reduce the credit country, but this guy is making the credit country more severe. Right. In your paper, you say there is a positive relationship between the economic capital and the intergenerational mobility. Yes. Uh, there is some interesting common things. Uh, I'd like to see the capital results in your paper. Can you uh, talk about the method per flow session or not per flow session about this result? Sorry, I didn't, cannot quite understand your question. Uh, you say yeah. there is a positive relationship be between return to owner character and the intergenerational mobility. Negative relation, not positive. Negative. Yeah, you see, the higher is this number, the higher is this coefficient. The higher is this coefficient, the lower the mobility. Not not positive, negative correlation. Okay. Uh, the second is, uh, do you collect the data? Do you uh, consider uh, pay, pay attention to inflation factor? Because inflation. Yeah, that's our real day, real wage. Yeah. Inflation will affect the yes, equity yes. Yeah. and the, the growth of key. Yeah, yeah, they are they're all real. Okay, I guess uh, perhaps uh, keep any burning question during the lunch for me and uh, let uh, all the other people have lunch. Okay, thank you.